Hi, my name is Aaron Edwards, and as Vijay eloquently said, I run technical marketing here at CloudGenX. And I'm going to go through a little bit of the architecture really quick, and before we hop into some nice demos on the product. So Vijay t talked a little bit about our background and why we're doing a lot of what we're doing and what customers are seeing, but this is how we're actually implementing our product and how the CloudGenX solution actually looks from an overall design standpoint. So what we have is we have a cloud controller, and as Vijay said, everyone has controllers. We have options of having the controller available as a cloud, as a consumable service, uh, that customers can not have to deal with a, you know, the expense and time of putting up their own controller and managing it, or you can have a local controller that's actually customer owned, because we see several really large customers that say, you know, we like the idea of a cloud controller, but we want certain parts of that controller to either be on-premise for compliance reasons, or just for our own comfort and security. So we can break our controller up and have any parts of it in the cloud or in local. Then we have remote offices. Again, as we said, commodity x86 devices, whether it's our own silk screened, you know, hardened appliance that we can send out that people can plug and play, or your own server where you spin up a device and just run our software on either a virtual platform or physical. And then that coordinates with head-end appliances, which are the exact same type of form factor. So you have a different type of appliance that goes in the data center, different type of server and type of appliance that can go in the data center or branch. And then the third component is obviously cloud applications. So if you have cloud applications being YouTube, Citrix, Google, you know, we want to be able to manage and control those applications as well over any of these different medias. And a little bit later on, we'll go into more detail on how we actually do that. So what's nice about this solution is that we have really strive to get to the very low amount of configuration needed to insert us into a branch and data center. What's slick is that we have customers that are going out there and putting us out in a branch, and you can insert us in and have us going with no configuration changes to the branch whatsoever. And that was really, it's really nice for us to go out and, you know, say, Mr. Customer, I want to plug in, and now you can see immediate benefit of what's going on without the need to go out and have people touch things in a different environment all the time. So this is why we have customers that have store managers actually implementing our gear. And we'll show you that here next. So now we're going to go through and show three different steps that we have to actually get a device online. So when you have a CloudGenX device, you want to deploy it at a remote site. Um, first thing you do is you either get a physical appliance, which you can have drop shipped to the site. Uh, you can have a VM that gets spun up in the site where you bring up a new VM. Once this comes online, it will actually reach out to our cloud location service, which will then tell it, is it a local controller, is it a cloud controller? And then the device comes online and it's able to be claimed. And what claim does is claim is a secure way for you to actually check and make sure that this device is where you want it to be. It's your device. You don't just want to have a device that you send out to a site that just all of a sudden starts working and starts coming online and talking on your network. You want to make sure that, yeah, this, I want this device to go online. If I work for, you know, soda company A and I ship it out and it accidentally goes to my competitor, you know, don't want them to plug it in and be able to access my network. Yeah. So, Krishma, go ahead. Let's go ahead and claim it. So right now we're claiming a physical ION 3000. And so now it's gone into claiming status. So what's happening here is that uh, the device comes with an initial identity. Now when it's claimed, it, our CloudGenX PKI infrastructure, which we provide for all customers so that they have keys and certificates per VPN link, are now getting, that whole infrastructure system is getting installed on the device. So the device has come in, it's connected to the controller, it's saying, uh, I'm authorized now by her saying that I want to claim the device. So now it's getting all of its credentials, it's starting the key rotation where we start rotating the keys every day. Um, and that's all going in process. And now it's claimed and it should be available for configuration. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind is this is all done remotely. You do not actually need to be physically with the device. You don't need to touch the device whatsoever. The device just needs, as Vijay was saying, this is all can be done completely remotely. Um, and it's, it's the way it's designed. Um, all, it need, all the device needs is either the ability to talk on, the private, on your private network, like your MPLS, so that it can talk to the controller, or talk over the internet to the controller. What's slick is that it's, you know, it's just plug and play. It just goes and it just works. So <coughs> Go ahead, question. Okay. I was probably going to ask the same question as you. So do you typically set it up with an IP address before you ship it out, or do you set it up for DHCP by or default either or? For, by default, it's set up for DHCP on interfaces, but it's easy to actually set up a actual IP address. So on the VM version, you can go on the console of it, and you can give it an IP address. On the physical device, it has an LCD screen where you can go in and give it a specific IP address on site. So we program it when it ships out with the, the identity of the controller that, yep. the, that the customer so it already knows, it already knows the IP address it's it, looking it for for the yeah. controller. There's a there's a location service that lets it know which controller it needs to talk to, and each device can get pre-assigned, 
or you can have a claim, there's a, there's a method to go through and figure out a device if, for example, you bought one third party in the future. You know, we can just get to it. So for the virtual, you kind of have to do that yourself because we don't actually ship you your virtual hardware. Right. 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 The there, physical, we, uh, we pre-instantiate exactly. all of that you, 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 Your company puts that information yes. in. Okay. So there's no need just to do the be. typical pre-staging something exactly. and, uh, and doing stuff and then sending it off, right? We wanted to make that step go away operationally. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, you had mentioned that there's uh, there is like a, a cloud component even with a local controller that's not necessary. Yeah. So the, there's a as part of the claiming process, right. there is a referral service really that says you know when it connects when a new device comes online that's been just manufactured or a new VM comes online, it has to locate which controller it needs to talk to. So if is that a convenience factor or is that a it's a convenience factor? It's so a convenience if factor. If yeah. If you were to get a pre-configured appliance shipped out to a site, you wanted this wholly in-house. You didn't yeah. want any cloud components at all. Yeah. That would be a, a feasible deployment scenario. Yeah. yeah. It, you would just pre-program it with your controller address, yeah. and it would come across your private network, and away you'd go. Exactly. So what you would do is you would modify some. You would basically have it when you. You know, you have your private DNS servers, your private DHCP servers. You would hand specific information that would say, you know, don't go to the cloud location service, use local. Okay. All right, so once the device is claimed, I'm going to assign it to a site. There you go. So I have my site, which is already uh, created. I am looking up for the site. Going next, naming the device, branch, and um, yeah. Now, now you can go through and configure the different interfaces. So as you see by default, it's set for DHCP, and it'll give you information about which device pair, which different things are connected. So populate this so that way, if you have X amount of devices, you claim them all. But if, you know, if it's a certain device type or certain something to have a template pre-built for? Yes, definitely. So, so what's nice about this is that you don't really see it on the back end, but this is a web interface on top of a REST API. So we have a full API, and so for mass deployments, it's actually really simple to throw together a Python script and say, just clone all of these different templates right together. So. All right. So uh, the zero touch? It's yeah, and there we go. It's up and going. Up and running, connected to your network. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the VPN tunnel that we built. Yeah. And it's all zero touch, so no configs needed. Yeah. You said something earlier about the parts of the controller. Are the, are the parts just the, the claiming process? And so, so there's, there's getting into our controller architecture, there's really three main parts of the controller. There's our, there's our PKI infrastructure. So being able to have this whole you know, enterprise trust VPN stuff, we provide a PKI as part of our service. So as part of CloudGenix, you get this full certificate zero touch VPN you know, that just automatically works and goes. Doesn't use shared secret, uses an individual certificate and key pair per connection and possibly per uh, micro-segmentation instance. So your WAN context, your VRF-like construct. Uh, that's one part of it. The other part of it is just the actual management and orchestration that you're seeing Krishma do here. The third part is statistics because we hold a whole amount of statistics and analytics. So all three of these parts are part of our really components of our controller. And customers can want to do any one of those parts on-prem or, or remotely. You said something about rekeying daily. Is that a PKI operation or is that a VPN operation? It's both. So on PKI, so basically what happens is that we have a lifetime of the certificates and keys that we distribute through our, our controller protocol. And these are modifiable. So Basically, there's, there's, a, there's a matrix of how long you want the keys to work is really kind of survivability. So if the controller was to like be offline or unreachable, your keying time lifetime is your, basically your site survivability this lifetime. Certificate lifetime. Yes, yeah, certificate lifetime. By default, the system will automatically uh, renegotiate keys on a per link basis yep. every hour. Yeah. Okay, and that's, that's the, the encryption. That's the key, yeah, the certificate. The certificate, yeah. 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 as opposed to the certificate. And then... Um, uh, the one thing about the WAN as opposed to the data center, one of many things, is that your WAN controller uh, may, is likely not going to be 100% accessible over reliable links all the time. Yeah. So the system is designed so that you can continue to cycle through the, your keys and operate at full uh, capability in the event that the controller is unavailable. Okay. So uh, very, very survivable. Full every hour key rotation, unique keys per... Link, uh, policy enforcement. 
So for example, if I wanted to have, to, to expand on what Vijay was saying about the, the life cycle, if I wanted to have my network work for a week without the controller, we would set the lifetime, the certificate lifetime to a week. It would do like Vijay says, it rotates the key every hour within that week. But then after a week, if the controller was gone, then you could have a site that would go completely offline, which is actually a, a week's worth of VPN keys are, are distributed. No, no, it's able to negotiate. It's able to be negotiated. Yeah. So the keys aren't actually sent by the controller. Right. Um, what we've done is we've taken uh, some of the learnings from things like Kerberos and some yeah. of the DoD stuff, and um, what the, the you have a, a set of uh, military jargon uh, daily changing call signs or shared secrets yeah. that are uh, generated by the controller and sent to the endpoints. The endpoints will then um, negotiate the keys individually. Right. So your key material is known only by the two endpoints. Yeah. So our controller does not know what those private keys are. Right. So there's no ability to do a global compromise. So the endpoints authenticate each other with their certificates? There's mutual and authentication they, yeah. and there yeah. is um, on a link-by-link, uh, site-by-site uh, key negotiation. Gotcha. Yeah. And it's, a nice, it's actually nice because it's a fully distributed model. Yeah. So you can have high-frequency key rotation with strong keys without the traditional scalability issues that you see with typical PKI. We can maintain perfect forward secrecy without requiring constant uh, Diffie-Hellman negotiations between the different devices. Because they can authenticate each other whenever they need to. Yes, so yes. If I wanted to, let's just assume that there was no effort to rotate keys. And the, and the other thing is that you also want to be able to instantly rotate, revoke a key if a device gets stolen. Like Because we're dealing with branch offices here, and quite often people break in and you know, do a smash and grab, take everything. And you want to be able, and that's one of the problems that DMVPN, other original VPN protocols had, is if you had certificates and keys, and it was a pain in the rear to rotate them and revoke them, you know, now you have to go through into a whole network change, which can take forever. Now with us, we can just revoke one device, and even if the device can't be contacted to say, give up your certificate, all the other devices can, and they immediately will, will let it go. Well, they, they must do revocation checking with, with every authentication, I would think. So what happens is, is that, uh, it's part of the, the actual algorithm is that if we revoke the, we reissue the algorithm to all the different devices now that, that it, the, the stuff that it had to work with doesn't work. 